so for some reason my slides are not at the beginning. Uh, so I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to... Uh, oh, the spoilers! All the spoilers! Sorry about that. Uh, all right, so... Uh, staying human when you're working uh, with emerging technologies, you have two main obstacles that you have to overcome. The first set of obstacles are in your own brain, and uh, the second set of obstacles are uh, more logistic. I'm going to spend more time on the brain problem because it's the much harder by far problem to solve. And also, I think most of you in this audience have kind of a clue about how to, uh, how to overcome the logistical part. So I'll talk about that as well, but we'll spend more time on the, on the first set of obstacles. Okay, so your first responsibility, uh, and one of the ways that you as a designer can have the biggest impact, is to be critical. Uh, when you're working in emerging technology, especially, you are always potentially on the dark side, whether you like to think about it or, uh, or not. So think about it, right? Play out that black mirror scenario of your product. Like, Take the time. Remember that accessibility is a thing that exists. Spend like just a day thinking about what a disabled person is going to do with your product. Be critical, be paranoid, be that person in your team, and don't fall for the inevitability argument. When your developers are saying like, oh, it's no point to care about privacy because privacy ship has sailed and there's no, nothing we can do about it, don't accept it. Don't design for some kind of uh, post-capitalist, post-racial, post-national Star Trek utopia because that is clearly not the world your product is going to exist in. Another reason that designers in emerging technology have an have a, a extremely important impact is that the people who bring new technologies first from research into consumer space are always followed, right? Consciously or unconsciously, uh, you set the direction, you create a norm, you define a template, and people are gonna do what you did. Uh, back in the early days of mobile applications, when the iPhone first came out, this menu grid, uh, home screen grid, made a very big impression on designers, and it got copied not only in uh, other mobile applications on iPhone, but even on other platforms, and it stuck around for a really long time. You don't see it so much anymore, but it was really a big, big, uh, big trope for a long time. Also, when you work in emerging technology, your bad decisions, your design mistakes, and your wrong assumptions can adversely impact uh, the adoption of a new tool. So the uh, slide is showing the first MP3 player, which had the capacity to hold more than 1,000 songs. It was commercially released in 1999. Uh, Compact designed it. It was sold under the very sexy name, The Compressor. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and it, was a, uh, and it was not a success. And uh, MP3 technology really didn't take off until, uh, until the iPad, iP iPod, sorry. So one of the biggest, like the really, really, really most common mistakes that, uh, that we make when we're doing, working in really new, uh, new areas, new technologies, new devices, new platforms, is uh, that we make analogies to the stuff that we already know. Either uh, we do it because we assume we know the answer to the problem from our past experience, or sometimes we argue that uh, users won't be able to learn a new paradigm, we have to make it look like the old stuff uh, so that they feel like their hand is being held. Um, this is another example from the portable MP3, MP3 player. This is the first ever portable MP3 player, and that is a Sony Discman. Uh, the Discman also came in silver. I just couldn't find a good picture of it. Early web design shows you this as well. When, uh, when we came to the web, most of the designers who worked on the, on the web in the early days came from print. So we built websites that looked uh, and behaved and were structurally organized like a book or a magazine. And that, uh, honestly, we're st we still have... Uh, 
the legacy of, the, of that bad decision uh, to this day. And now, uh, in the IoT, which is my favorite uh, part of technology right now, we are also seeing a lot of projects that are using the mobile device as the front end of the product or as the remote control of the universe. And we're not doing that because it's the right thing to do. We're doing that because that's what we know how to do. Because most of us who are working in the IoT now are people who were previously working on mobile applications. Uh, this slide is showing you on one side the uh, WeThings scale, the original one, where you see that the, uh, the graph for, your, uh, for tracking your weight is in the, on, the, on, the, on the phone. And the new WeThings scale that is not yet released but has been announced, where they've moved the graph to the, to the device, which is obviously better, right? It's just clearly better, but it still took them two years to figure it out. So if you don't squash these mind bugs, uh, it's not going to do you any good to find users and talk to them, right? The whole logistical problem of how do you find people uh, when the technology you work with is not really existing yet, it's not going to be solved if you don't already get over these you know, mind issues. So I'm just going to spend one more minute on this, and then we'll uh, zip through the uh, logistical problem, and then we can go have a beer. All right. You're wrong. You're wrong. Just remember, you are almost certainly wrong. You are not the user. This is a really interesting one. There's two medical startups that I know of, that, I've, uh, that I know the founders of. Uh, one of them is uh, MedAngel, which is uh, Berlin-based. Uh, the other one is called Immune Control. Uh, the Immune Control application is for monitoring your, it's, a, it's an IoT solution for uh, people who have organ transplants. The founder of the company has a, has a kidney transplant but he still doesn't think of himself as the user. So if that guy can do it, you guys can too, for sure. Ah, this one's really good too. Your, uh, your certainties are assumptions. All your assumptions are probably wrong. And a pro tip on this one that I have learned the hard way is the more passionately you believe in your certainty, the more likely you are to be really wrong. It's true, because when you have evidence, you don't need passion. You need that passion when, you, when you've got nothing behind it. All the things you think you know because of your past experience do not apply. Forget them. Well, don't forget them, but... And once... Oh, this is also a really important one. Once you figure something out, the answer that you discovered is eventually going to be wrong because the world is changing around you all the time. So all of your, uh, all of your findings have an expiration date. That's a, that's a real danger. That's like what we saw in the previous talk with the Sparkasse app. Those guys are building the wrong thing because they know too much. All right, so now that you've got that out of the way, uh, how do you find people to talk to? Uh, when, you know, nobody owns a VR headset, nobody's got a watch, how do you talk to users uh, when the technology that you're working with really doesn't, uh, almost doesn't exist? So, there's a couple of different things you can do. One, it's pretty hard to learn from other people's mistakes, but it is a really great skill if you can acquire it. Uh, you can get some secondhand information. Go to meetups, go to conferences, hackathons are great. Trade shows can be really interesting. I learned a lot of stuff at uh, CBIT. This is a photo from uh, the virtual reality meetup here in Berlin. It's very active and it's really great. You can try people's demos, you can ask them questions, you can find out uh, what, they've what mistakes they've already made. Oh, this one too is really good. When you're working in emerging technology, really look at what's going on in industry because a lot of new technology gets matured first in industri industry or in the military even. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff going on with augmented reality in medicine. There's robots all over the logistics scene. Uh, you can find out what's working and what's failing for users in that environment, which is not necessarily going to give you the right answer, but it can point you in the right direction. Look at mining, look at medicine, 
Look at agriculture, look at logistics, factories, distribution centers, smart cities, smart buildings. Google is your friend here. Like, uh, just look at what uh, General Electric is doing in terms of pilot programs. You'll find a lot of good insights there. And then you have to find some humans and test, test, test. Uh, you can only get so far with secondhand information. Uh, so a lot of times uh, the fact that the technology isn't mature is kind of used uh, there as an excuse not to talk to users. There are no users, so we can't talk to them. Oh, we just have to, you know, make our best guess. Um, it's not about the technology, it's about the problem you're solving. Even if you, even if the person doesn't have, you know, a connected home or a, a, a wearable or anything like that, you can still find out what are they doing, what, what are they doing to solve the problem today? What can you do better? What can you uh, give them that they can't get from the existing technology? And also, you know, it's always trying to find out whether you're even solving the right problem in the first place, right? It's not about putting the, uh, the cart before the horse, it's about, like, do you even need a horse and cart in the first place? Uh, one example here is, uh, this is from a, a company called Relayer. They built a thing called the Wunderbar. The audience for that are DIYers and hackers. I went to uh, a couple of their early, early hackathons. So they threw a hackathon because they wanted to get to know their users who were us uh, tinkerers. And uh, they did a, such a great job with this that uh, they were literally writing APIs for the, uh, for the participants on the fly during the hackathon. That's a great example of how to get close to your users. Uh, hackathons also can be really uh, an opportunity to do a little user research. The interesting thing in this slide is the uh, gone to Tegel Airport sign behind. The winning team of this, uh, this was a hackathon about um, uh, beacons in airports, beacon networks in airports. And the winning team actually went to the airport to go and talk to users about the problem that they wanted to solve. They didn't need to talk to users about beacons. They talked to them about unaccompanied minors. And it's Definitely good to do user testing with professional researchers and external users, but uh, it's also good to supplement with some internal users. Like, don't recruit, if you have a company that's big enough, especially, don't recruit your designers and try to avoid engineers, but look at your HR department and your finance department. You're going to find a lot of people there who are um, going to be able to give you a lot of good feedback. Also, Another advantage of doing uh, uh, testing with internal users is it's much easier to get your engineers close to the testing. It can be really hard to get your engineers uh, to to get your engineers to a focus group or something. Like nobody wants to give you budget to send your dev lead to the focus group. But if you do testing with internal testers. You can organize it yourself with the team. You can get the developers looking, and it's a really great way to. Uh, start to get developers to focus on problems over solutions. Also, you have never seen a bug get fixed faster than after an engineer sees a human person suffer from it. I'm not going to talk too much about this one. Prototyping, everybody knows that you're supposed to do it, and I almost never see it happen, but I promise you it's magic. Just do it. Do it. <laughs> this is a really fancy prototype. But these also work. This is also fine. You can get a lot more information when you have a, a, an object to look at than when you have um, you know, pictures or descriptions. And the last thing, so we're almost done here, almost beer time. So uh, service design is actually going to be, I think, is really well positioned to be really essential in uh, emerging technologies. Uh, especially in this like vast umbrella domain that we call the Internet of Things. Uh, interdisciplinary thinking is already very strong in service design. When it comes to the IoT, you don't, you can't, nobody knows the answer. The engineer doesn't know the answer, the designer doesn't know the answer, the business person doesn't know the answer. Everybody's got a piece of it. If you just even think about the problem of pairing uh, you know, pairing a device to your Wi-Fi and then syncing it, like everybody has a piece to solve in that puzzle. 
The concept of touch points is completely replacing the concept of front ends, especially when it comes to the IoT. It's not about wearables or screens or connected devices or push notifications or anything else. Those are all just means to the end, and service design is really um, best positioned to understand that, I think, in the design universe right now. Just remember, so last, last word, just remember while you're out there shaping the future, building uh, what comes next. You don't know anything. The only way to find anything out is to talk to human people. And never let the fact that the, there are no users be an excuse not to talk to some humans. And don't forget to think negative. I think there shouldn't be any questions, right? <laughs> but maybe there are. We have time for two questions, I think. Um, who has a question to Tracy right now? Oh, really, no questions? Come on. Is there, oh, no, someone's just raising a phone. I, I have a question. Who is the sexy guy in the photo? <laughs> that, was, that was a joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's before you got a haircut, right? <laughs> Oh, there's a question. There's, there's a question. question. Got it. I get all the points except the think negative one. Mm. Why shouldn't we think positive? Uh, because we have, we already are thinking positive, right? Uh, and that means that we're building, uh, we're building extremely hackable uh, IoT solutions that uh, just recently actually caused a very big breakdown in the internet. It means that we are not giving a crap about privacy because our privacy for us rich white people is uh, not very valuable to us. We don't really need it. We can throw it away. But not everybody is in that position. Uh, and we we already are, we already, I, I, I live it, right? Like I know people are building as if, as if we live in this, you know, utopian future. And when the next round of Western totalitarians comes into power, they are going to have a lot to play with. It's really, uh, you know, something we need to think about more and talk about more. Thank you.